Last week I covered how Genesis 1-1 explains the creation of time, space, and matter by God the Creator. I also covered the literal 24-hour, seven-day creation week with God resting on the seventh day. So we've begun this new journey in the book of Genesis. That's a very short summary of Genesis 1. Uh, you've all seen it. You can go back and watch it for anyone who hasn't, but I believe everyone here has, has seen it. So Genesis 2 uh, begins with a recap or summary statement of the creation. And then it goes on to explain specific details of the sixth day of creation, which is the creation of man, and also the creation of the Garden of Eden, with man being made on the last day, on the sixth day, as God's crowning achievement and culmination of everything that had come before, that God had created before. And so with that, Genesis 2.1 begins with the words, Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Now, stop for a minute at the word thus. That's the very first word of Genesis 2, verse 1, thus. And I highlight the word thus because there is a serious heresy out there which claims that Genesis 2 is a completely different account of creation than what we just studied in Genesis 1. That the accounts between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are contradictory. And so they say that unlike Genesis 1, Genesis 2 has God making man first, and then he makes the plants after that. That's the order that some people see being listed in Genesis 2. Whereas Genesis 1 says that the plants were created on day 3, and then you had the creation of man on day 6. So in Genesis 2, they say the order is reversed, and therefore there is a contradiction between the Genesis accounts, or even that these are separate accounts, that there was one creation, and then something happened between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, where the, they were all destroyed, and then God you know, started again in Genesis 2 with a new creation. These are the errors that are put out there. And I even have an old commentary from Marshall, who loaned it to me, um, you know, some time back, and I was just flipping through to see, you know, what have, do other people believe this, and what do they, you know, what do they teach on this, and this was written back in the 60s, this commentary, or early 70s, and they were making mention of this. Now, they were refuting it, uh, but this idea that there's a contradiction between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 isn't a new idea, but we're seeing it now, you know, more prominently because of social media. And so it is, it's an old heresy, but it's a very, very wicked one. It's, it's, a, it's a lie, basically, uh, that there are two creation accounts. There's only one creation, but we have a different perspective that we get in Genesis 2. And so the people who, who go along with this, they get this from Genesis 2, 7 through 9, which reads... And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So we see that the order sounds like on the surface that it's been reversed there, and they interpret this to mean that man was made first, because that's mentioned first there, and then God caused the plants to grow up in the garden after that. That's how they read it. But this is such an obvious error in the reading of the Word of God that it makes me think that only an unsaved, unregenerate mind would interpret the Bible this way. Here's the correct interpretation. Genesis 1 is an overview of the cosmic events of the six-day creation. Chapter 1 lists what God made specifically on each of the days of creation. It's a specific chronological list of, you know, he made, you know, he, breathed, he, he spoke and there was light and he went through and all the different days what he made. He made the plants on day three, etc. Um, and so it just, you know, it goes through a chronological account of the creation days. Then we get to Genesis 2, and the Bible gives us 
at first a broad summary and a concluding verse of what we just read in Genesis 1. Thus, it begins, the heavens and the earth were finished. That's why that word thus is important because it's linking back again to Genesis 1, what we just read. And then Genesis 2 continues to recap parts of the creation week and then focuses in more specifically on the details of man in the Garden of Eden. And so we see that Genesis 1 is a chronological account, whereas Genesis 2 is a thematic account of the creation. It's less focused on the chronology of events and more focused on how the different parts of the creation interacted with one another and with God. And here's the key. God had already made the plants on day three, as we talked about, and he'd already made man on day six. That was done. That was Genesis 1. Now God is creating a garden eastward of Eden. That's what that's talking about. It says right there, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. goes on about breathing life into him. Then in verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So Genesis 2, 7 through 9 is not an account of the, you know, the wild life and the wild plants and the herbs that he made for food and just globally being created across the world. Genesis 2 is an account of the Garden of Eden, a garden that, that, man, that God had created for man eastward of Eden, where man would now be responsible for cultivating that garden. You know, so Genesis 2 is an account of the cultivated garden of Eden versus the global creation of all the plants and trees and herbs across the entire world. And so this is uh, Genesis 2 is less of a chronology and more a logical thematic account of what actually happened on day six and what followed after pertaining specifically to the Garden of Eden. And so that's how we see it. You see, we see that Genesis 2, according to the word, is man-centric. And I don't mean, you know, it's ultimately about God. I'm not saying it's about man. But the focus of the narrative in Genesis 2 here is focused now on the story of man. In Genesis 1, it was the story of the creation in general. And now it's specifically targeted and focused on the history of man and his relationship to God and the creation. Genesis 2.7 also gives us the specific details of how God created man out of the dust of the earth and breathed, breathed life into him. So we're getting these you know, greater details about the creation of man about the sixth day. And dust, by the way, is a reference also to the earthly elements from which man was made. He was literally made of the substance of the earth. And we know that even scientifically, scientists affirm that man is largely composed of elements that we have in common with the earth. So that is literally true. We were literally made out of the lowly dust of, of the earth, yet we were made in God's image. Now, another portion of Genesis 2 that they claim contradicts Genesis 1 is Genesis 2.19. This is another verse that they use to say, well, there's two different accounts. And it says, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And their claim is that this contradicts the account of God creating the mammals on the fifth day. Because on Genesis 2.19, on the surface, it seems to be saying that God created the beasts and then brought them to Adam as though, the, as though Adam was there before the beasts were created. So it sounds like on the surface, man was already there, and then out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and brought it to Adam to name him. That's how they interpret it. Whereas we know from Genesis 1, when you synchronize the accounts, that this is just simply recapping the fact that God had made the animals, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field. It's just repeating what happened on day 5 in Genesis 1, and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. So this is not a chron chronological account in 2.19. It's a recap. And then it's focused on what God did on day six. So you can see how unsaved 
or maybe saved heretics who are just way out there, you know, which is hard to believe that somebody could read Genesis this way and be saved, though maybe theoretically it's, it's possible. I doubt it. But, you know, it's, it just shows that these are mostly unsaved people who have an un you know, who have an unregenerate natural reading of God's word because the natural mind doesn't understand the things of God. And so they don't, they don't understand this. This is something that the Holy Spirit just, we read it and we know instantly what this is talking about because the Holy Spirit is giving us, you know, wisdom and insight. And so we see that, um, you know, this is just a, a, the story of man, the details of the creation. And um, it's a recap, Genesis 2, 4. That's why Genesis 2, 4 says, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. It's a summary statement. It's a, it's a recap of what already occurred. And that's why Genesis 2, 1 begins with the word thus. So Genesis 2 is giving us another perspective of the creation account. These words, these are the generations of, from Genesis 2, 4, appear actually many times throughout the Bible where, where we get into the genealogies of the patriarchs. So the book of Genesis is a genealogical account. It's, it's tracing the history of man and of the creation. Genesis 1 is a genealogy of the creation itself. And then later we get into ge the genealogy of the, of the men of God and the patriarchs through whom Jesus himself would come. And so, again, this tells us, if anything, that Genesis is an account of history. It's not allegory. It's an historical account of, of creation history. And the Bible is simply, simply chronicling what occurred in the beginning and that genealogical history continues throughout the entire book of Genesis with the account of the men and the families of God as they begin uh, you know, to, to come upon the earth. So there's no contradiction. There's only one created creation narrative. And so now that the, that has been answered, the Genesis critics have been answered, let's back up and read through Genesis 2, starting at verse 1. Let's read through the chapter and get an account of the real story of the creation in Genesis 2. So Genesis 2, starting at verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So again, we have the word thus, indicating the completion of the chronological creation account. And then we get to the main focus of the start of Genesis 2, the seventh day Sabbath. It says, God finished the work of creation in six days, and he rested from his creative work on the seventh day. Later in Exodus 20, God gives his people the ten commandments and reaffirms the establishment of the Sabbath of the seventh day. And the fourth commandment given in Exodus 20, 8 through 11 is this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So God sets us a pattern to follow. God creates a day of rest where we cease from our own works. And that's, he does this by himself. Now, you know, God could have chosen to create the universe in an instant, but he chose to do this. It was a willful choice to create in six days and to take rest on the seventh day. I believe partly why he did this was to give us an example to follow in the seven day week and to take a rest on the seventh day. At least that was the Old Testament ordinance. And what that really pointed to is the fact that we also now cease from our own works as we rest in Christ, as, as Christ becomes our Sabbath. It's a picture of not working 
for salvation. It's a picture of ceasing to do works in order to be saved. Again, we can go into works. We're supposed to do works, uh, but not for salvation. And so the, the New Testament is clear that the Sabbath is no longer a requirement as a commandment for the saved Christian. Well, why? Because, again, the Sabbath was an Old Testament commandment, and we are no longer bound to the commandments of the law. Not in the way, you know, it's, it's a schoolmaster to teach us what sin is. It's a guide to show us, you know, how to live godly. You know, the moral laws are still the moral laws. They don't change. But in terms of our contract with God, our covenant with God, we are now under the tenets of the New Testament, the new covenant shed in the blood of Jesus. The old, the Bible says, is waxed old. You know, that's no longer, it's been replaced by the new. There is a difference between the old and the new. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called the new. But that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't take into account what God says in his moral laws, you know, and, and continue to use that as our guide, though we have liberty in Christ. So it's understanding those nuances and understanding which covenant you're under. You want to make sure you're under, the, you're living, you're believing under the new covenant or you're not saved. If you're relying on the old, that's done away with, you're not saved. You need to be under the new covenant. We are now under the new covenant of grace. So Jesus himself, under the new covenant of grace, has become our Sabbath rest. Hebrews 4.3 says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. You see, it's through that faith in Christ that we enter into rest. The Sabbath is a picture of ceasing from our own Work. So those who, those who are still not resting in Christ, those who are still trying to save themselves or do some kind of works in conjunction with faith haven't truly entered into the rest of Christ. They haven't ceased from their own works. They're relying on themselves instead of on Christ's finished work. Hebrews 4, 9 through 10 says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. That says exactly what I just told you, right? So those, there remaineth the rest of the people of God, those that have, for he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. It's a picture of resting in Christ for our salvation. <clears throat> continuing in Genesis 2. So the first is the Sabbath, Genesis 1 through 3, and then continuing in verse uh, for Genesis 2, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Notice here also the mention of the phrase the Lord God in Genesis 2 4. Whereas in Genesis 1, it was always God. God created the heaven and the earth. Every mention of God was God in Genesis 1. Now, for the first time, we're introduced to the Lord God in Genesis 2, 4. And if you notice, as you read throughout the rest of Genesis 2, every time that God is mentioned, he's referred to now as the Lord God. He mentions, that name is mentioned 11 times in Genesis 2 alone. And so the underlying Hebrew here is Jehovah Elohim. That's, that's the name, the Lord God. Okay, I'm not going to interpret that for you in, in the Hebrew. We can get that from the English. But it's, it's edifying to understand that, you know, when in Genesis 1, when it says God, the underlying word is Elohim, which is a, pl a plural God. It's the plurality. Uh, Elohim is plural in, in Genesis 1. When we get to Genesis 2, the underlying is Jehovah Elohim, the Lord. So whenever you see the mention of the Lord in all caps, it's talking about Jehovah. You know, the, the Lord was, a, was what we've called later on the Tetragrammaton, which is a theological term for replacing the word Jehovah in the translations with the name or the title, the Lord. Okay, because in the, in the original, in the, in the, you know, the Jews, originally they believed that God's name Jehovah was so holy to pronounce that uh, they wouldn't verbalize it. They wouldn't even write it, so they replaced it with the Lord. And so whenever we see in the King James Bible, translators were consistent in that. They translated it the way that it was understood um, at that time. And so Jehovah Elohim, the Lord 
God is now what we get. And it's interesting that, you know, whereas before we got God, Elohim, now we get the personal name, Jehovah of the Godhead. As we begin to deal with man, God dealing with man, it gets personal. We get his name now, Jehovah, uh, listed in, in Genesis 2. So that's the significance of, of the Lord God versus, versus God. And so it's, and it's, it's J-H-V-H, which we pronounce Jehovah. And so Genesis 2, as, as God interacts with man, he reveals himself in his personal name of Jehovah. And uh, continuing in verse 5 of Genesis, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Now, up to this point, rain was non-existent in the earth. The first account of rain is mentioned in Genesis 7, when God floods the earth with with the rain and with the, the fountains of the deep. But in verse 7, it says, Uh, We continue, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So God makes man. First we have this mist coming up. God himself is watering the earth, watering the plants, and then he forms man because there's yet no man. Man hadn't been created yet. And then he forms man, and he breathes into him the breath of life. We see that that God makes man out of the lowly dust of the earth, but he breathes his divine breath on him to make him a living being. Job uh, says in Job 33, 4, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Behold, I am according to thy wish in God's stead. I also am formed out of the clay. So we see the clay interchanged with the dust. Um, It's the elements, it's the clay, it's the mud, it's the minerals. You know, we have those things in in our bodies. And so Job affirms the truth of Genesis 2. Isaiah affirms the same truth in Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. So again, Isaiah refers to it as the clay, you know, and God shaping us out of that clay and out of that dust. So, you know, it's interesting that we're, we're, you know, made in God's image, but we're made, you know, as lowly creatures out of the dust. There's the humility that, you know, we need to be aware of and, and be humble and that we're just out of, you know, made out of the dust. But we have the divine breath of the Lord and are made in his image. So this made man, this breath of life and being made in the image of God, the lowly, it made man different from all the creatures which God had made. Man could now reason and discourse like no other creature could. This set man apart from the rest of the creation. It set him apart as God's crowning achievement. And continuing in verses 8 through 9 of Genesis 2, the Bible says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I find it interesting that, you know, God places man in this garden, and he places the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the midst of that garden. It's right in the middle, so that man can't miss it. You know, it's, it's right there in the center of everything that's going on in the Garden of Eden. And so again, this was a cultivated garden, that God had made after the creation, at least he expected man to cultivate that garden. And he made it after the creation of the plants on the third day. And he plants man in this garden eastward of Eden. Now again, the fact that there is a geophysical location for Eden asserts the fact that this was a literal, physical place and not just an allegorical place place or a place that's emblematic of paradise. This was a physical place with a geographical location. 
And so man was to live in this Edenic paradise and to cultivate it. Verse 9 also mentions the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And people often wonder what the actual tree of the knowledge of good and evil was. But the quality and the substance of the tree was less important than the alternative that its prohibition provided for man. Okay, the tree of life was there to give man eternal life. And we'll get to that a bit more because God, man wasn't made, um, he got, man wasn't eternal from the very beginning the way God was. So God had the tree of life there to give him eternal life. And we'll see that a bit more in Genesis 3. But we see that the tree of life of the knowledge of good and evil was there to give man an alternative to following God, an alternative to being in obedience to him. So it wasn't, it wasn't so much important, you know, was it an apple, a pear, a fig? That's not really the point. The substance of the tree isn't mentioned for a reason. It, it's, not the, it's not the focus of the story. The focus of the tree of, uh, of the you know, knowledge of good and evil is that it's prohibition. The fact that God said you can't eat from this tree provided man an alternative to following God. It gave man will. It gave man a choice. And so this opened up the possibility of choice and will uh, for man. And so man could now not only uh, reason and think and communicate as a living soul, but by the presence and prohibition of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, man is now endowed with the ability to exert his own will, even if that his, his will and his choice meant exerting his will in defiance of God's will. The tree of knowledge of, and good and evil gave man an alternative to being a robot and mindlessly following God. Notice also, like I mentioned, that there is no apple mentioned in, in Genesis 2. The apple was popularized as the forbidden fruit in John Milton's famous artistic work, Paradise Lost. So that was such a great, you know, famous work of literature at the time that people actually, you know, thought it was the apple that the Bible talked about an apple, whereas he was using that figuratively himself uh, to describe, you know, it was a poetic, it was a poetic story uh, that Milton wrote. But in the Bible, it's simply the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice also that God says, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. So again, the phrase freely eat indicates that man was now given a choice. That was done at the same time that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was, was presented to man. The fact that God is adding a restriction and saying you can eat of this tree and not of that tree indicates that man had free will from the start. And there's no indication to believe that we have anything but free will now. It's just that our, we love sin and our free will and our, and, our, and our will is corrupt. And so this was all in, and the purpose was to, again, just to create an alternative. Genesis 2 starting at verse 10 through 15, continues. And it says, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that, it, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedilum, Bedilum and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So, so man was the steward of the Garden of Eden. But again, these verses, this geographical mention here of its location indicates that Eden was a literal, physical location in the earth. Now, all these rivers used to run together at one point, these four rivers that are mentioned. But after the flood, the topography of the earth was drastically changed. And so today, trying to locate the site of Eden with any kind of certainty based on 
the, you know, the location that the Bible mentions is an impossibility because the whole, you know, the geography and the topography of the earth was changed drastically after the flood. But we know at least that it was somewhere in the Middle East based on the rivers mentioned such as the Euphrates and most scholars today accept that Hittichel, uh, which is mentioned, is the Tigris River today. So they have some general idea, but we don't know. People have tried to find it, but we don't know. It's impossible to find its general location that has been closed off to man. So again, we see that because of its geophysical location, that this was, again, factual history, not allegory. And in Genesis 2, 16 through 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, we covered this for the most part, but... This was the only admonition that God gives man, which is that if he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that he would surely die. There was no variance there. There was no, you know, it wasn't, you, you probably will. It was a definite statement. You will die if you eat of this, of this tree. And God didn't tell man why. Man was expected to obey God without questioning his motives. So God desires our obedience also, even when we don't understand the reason we need to be in obedience to God if we're to even attempt to be a disciple of Christ. And we also see that there weren't Ten Commandments yet. You know, the Ten Commandments had not been given. There is only one commandment, obey God. You know, and ultimately, doesn't the Ten Commandments, you know, isn't that the same thing, obey God, when you obey the Ten Commandments, you're obeying God? Later, that, you know, that commandment was explicated on, and you know, we were given certain terms of, of how we were to do that. But at this point, there was one commandment, you know, don't eat of that tree. And you know, we, couldn't, we couldn't even keep that. So later, you know, even though God, we see, gave man very certain terms, he said, you will surely die if you eat this, of this tree. We see that later Satan cast doubt on God's very direct and clear and plain statement in the Bible, just like he does today with the most simple and clearest scriptures that we have. He takes something that's so plain and simple and sure and obvious, and he comes, well, what about this verse over here? You know, and it's always some obscure verse that is misinterpreted. So always go with the plain statements of God, you know, for if you don't want any error in your, in your doctrine. Genesis 2, 18 through 20. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Again, it's recapping that. And brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found in help meet for him. So God now brings all the beasts of the field which he had formed to Adam so that Adam could give them a name. Naming something, especially in ancient cultures, was declaring your authority and dominion over that thing. If, if you have the power to name someone, you are an authority over that person at that, you know, at that juncture, at least in your life. Um, and so Adam, through this act of naming, uh, was just reflective of the fact that he had dominion and authority over all the beasts of the earth and all the fowl of the air. And in so doing, Adam comprehended, as he was going about this, this task, he comprehended that no other creature that God had made was suitable unto him. Since none of these creatures was equal to him, Adam wanted a counterpart that would be equal to him, that he could, he could relate to and that could be his helpmeet. For Adam there was not found an helpmeet for him. Genesis 2, 21 says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. So God responds to that right away. And it says, And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. 
And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now for Adam, that was very literal. That was a very literal statement. The woman was literally taken out of man. For us, it's a you know, it's a spiritual picture of that. When we get married, we are to spiritually become one flesh with our wife the way that, you know, God had, had done that between Adam and Eve. And so God makes woman's Adam, uh, God makes woman Adam's equal, his counterpart. Yet woman was made from a part of man. And the significance here is that woman was to be the counterpart. You know, she's a part of, a counterpart of man because she, she was literally taken out of a part of man. And so as his counterpart, she was to be his constant and suitable companion and his source of constant help. And so although woman was equal in value, Man is placed in a position of authority and leadership over the woman, which was a part of God's natural order of creation. You know, whether you like it or not, you know, that's just, that's how it is. Ephesians 5.22, um, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So <coughs> Paul reaffirms this in Ephesians 2. He could do nothing else. He wouldn't contradict God's word. Verse uh, 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So the role of women in the Bible is to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. That's a high command. It says as unto the Lord. Women, the way that you treat your husbands should be as though what you are doing, you are doing unto the Lord. Now that's a lofty objective, but it, and it takes real humility. You know, the pride won't allow you to do that. It takes humility. And men are supposed to protect, love, and cherish their wives the way that Christ loves his church and gave himself for it. So we need to be as men willing to sacrifice ourselves and to die for our wives and to die for our families. That's the command that, that God gives. 1 Peter 3, 5 through 7 says, For after this manner in the old time the holy women also, they're holy women, I love that phrase, um, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. So how do you become holy women? You subject yourselves unto your own husbands and you get the imputed righteousness of Christ as a foundation, of course. Verse six, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now we'll get into Genesis 3, why the woman is called the weaker vessel here. It's not an insult. It's just, you know, we'll get into that in, in verse 3, uh, in chapter 3. But we see also that your prayers could be hindered. If, if you're not following this, the, the prayers of the family and of the husband and wife, it says, will be hindered, um, that your prayers be not hindered. So we need to follow the godly example that is set forth for us in his word if we want God to bless us with his loving kindness and his, and his loving favor and, and to, you know, to answer our prayers. 1 Corinthians 11.3 also says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. So there's an authority there. We as men are now subject to Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ, which is Jesus Christ, is God being God the Father. There's a hierarchy even within the Godhead. We see it just you know, trickle down you know, from, from God to Christ to man to woman to the beasts of the field. You know, there's a hierarchy present within the creation order. And that's why Satan loves to pervert this order. If he can just, you know, put a disruption in that, 
in that godly order of creation, everything will fall apart. We all become dysfunctional and our, our families fall apart. We fall into wickedness. Nations fall into iniquity. It's just a chain event. You know, it, it all hinges on, you know, like the evangelists in the 80s and 90s, you know, they always talked about family values, you know, in the church and focus on the family and different ministries of that time. Um, it's an important thing, you know, to, to keep intact the godly family uh, the way that God intended. And so in this way, God establishes the perfect order and structure for the godly family who is then commanded to be fruitful and to multiply, not to take birth control and abort their babies. This also leaves no room within God's ordained order for anything but a heterosexual monogamous marriage. Anything else is considered anathema according to the Bible. Continuing in Genesis 2.24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So right there in the beginning, in Genesis 2, the creation of the world, you know, shortly after, God establishes the institution of marriage as between one man and one woman, and so marriage wasn't a new thing. It wasn't something the culture invented later on. It was right there. You know, after day seven, it was, it was instituted, um, actually on day six. And so God establishes the institution of marriage as between one man and one woman, the woman who was taken out of man, who was made to be man's counterpart and helper, must now cleave one to another and form a new family. And so Genesis 2.25 ends with, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. <coughs> so we know that this speaks of the, in, of the innocency that Adam and Eve possessed before the fall. They were sinless before the fall. But it also speaks this, this idea that they could be naked among one another and not be ashamed speaks of the absolute perfection of, of God's creation. Okay, the fact that they were not ashamed. If you're perfect and without sin, if you have no blemish in, you, in your soul, in your body, I mean, there's just no imperfection in Adam and Eve, what would there be to be ashamed of at that point, right? So a little bit of a, you know, uncomfortable subject because we are sinners, you know, but, but the way that the Bible, you know, the reason why they were not ashamed is because they were without sin. They were perfect. They were without blemish, body, mind, and soul in every way. And so they were not ashamed. They had no shame in them without that sin inside of them. And so... <clears throat> Everything about the creation at this point, including both the cosmos and man himself, was at this point in world history nothing short of sinless perfection. You know, that is the only time we saw sinless perfection. You know, there's people that preach about, you know, sinless perfection now, but it was the only time there was sinless perfection was when Adam and Eve, you know, in the garden before they sinned, and then in Jesus Christ himself, who is later called the second Adam. That's why he's called that. That's the only time we see perfection is before the fall and in Christ and then in, in us, in our spirit, when we're born again. So I'm going to take about 10 minutes to conclude Genesis 2 and the account of creation with this. <clears throat> so Genesis 1 Genesis 1 began with the words, in the beginning, God. So God is the subject of Genesis, and he's the central figure of the entire Bible. And in many ways, the Bible is an account of his relationship with man. Genesis lays out the, of, you know, the story and the account of the creation and the fall of man. And the rest of the Bible is really God's redemptive story culminating in Jesus' second coming in the wrath of God and the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. That's what we see. You know, first we have the creation, perfection, the fall, sin, and then we get the promise of the Messiah, the gospel. And it be, the whole thing then from that point becomes the redemptive story of man. That's what the whole Old Testament in its, you know, in its broader sense is really about. And then we get, you know, Jesus Christ, the church, the believers, you know, we get into all that till we get to Revelation, 
where we see the entire creation restored after the fall, the new heaven and the new earth. So that's the broad story of the Bible, Genesis, with a lot of stuff in between from Genesis to Revelation. And so that's what we're beginning you know, to, to see, and, and we're seeing the, the genesis of it. And so while there are many critics of the Bible, and especially critics of Genesis, who set out to disprove God and to undermine his written word, we wholeheartedly believe that the Bible in its present form is the final arbiter of truth. Proverbs 35 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And so there may be certain things that we don't always understand about the Bible and about the creation. You know, I'm not a scientist, and sometimes I'll say stupid things about science, you know, that I don't understand. And that's fine. You know, people have called me on certain things. I like to dabble in it, and I, you know, it's interesting to me. But ultimately, I'm a preacher of God's word. It's going to be a lot harder for you to find me in error in, in the doctrine of the word than about something like history or science. So if I say scientific things, take it with a grain of salt. That's fine. You know, but one thing we know is that the word of God is pure. Okay, he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So when we find something that we don't understand, particularly, you know, within the creation or Genesis, just hold it for a bit and research it and you'll always find that it's backed up by God's written word, that there's always an answer for everything. There are no errors or contradictions in God's word. So, for example, one question that I struggled with for some time and one that Genesis critics often bring up is this. If the earth is 6,000 plus years old, as the genealogies and the history of the Bible shows, how could the light from the stars, which are you know, millions of miles away, as you know, it's what's the scientific claim, maybe you know, some Christians dispute that distance, even if they're hundreds of thousands of miles away. You know, there's, if they're millions or hundreds of thousands of miles away, how could that light from those stars possibly reach us in the first days of creation? You know, because it's traveling, you know, light has a certain speed. And if it's traveling at the speed of light millions of miles away, how would man, how would even we see that light, even if, you know, if the earth is 6,000 years old? Well, one answer that theologians have put forth is that the speed of light was not as constant as it is today. That light moved at a much faster rate than it does today, and that the speed of light decayed over time and that it that slowed down. In fact, some scientists have observed that the speed of light has been slowing down ever so slightly. They've, they, they claim that they've observed a degression in the speed of light. And so you can take that, you know, one possible solution is to take that, you know, to its logical conclusion that light was faster, you know, so that the light could get here during the creation and then it, and then God set certain laws into motion to slow it down. But hard-nosed scientists and Bible critics are not satisfied with this answer, and perhaps rightly so, because it is purely theoretical and conjectural. You know, I'm not completely satisfied with that answer. So we have several solutions that we can present. Number one, just as God made man mature in age at the moment of his creation, God could have also made the creation mature in age also instantly at the beginning, including the light of the stars, which would have been present instantly at the moment of creation on the earth on that, you know, the fourth day when he made the stars and the sun. He could have simply chosen to do it in an instant, you know, and I believe that's very likely the answer. You know, we just take God at his word. I don't need to understand all the science of it. Um, it's entirely possible that he just made the, the stars mature. He made, it's probably the case, he made the light mature on the earth. Everything like man himself was made in its mature state right there, you know, f from day one through six in the beginning. That's, that's what I lean towards. But, you know, it's still somewhat conjecture, and the Bible doesn't tell us the exact mechanics of how God did this. Okay, the Bible wasn't written as a textbook of, you know, of scientific theory. It's not, it's not its purpose. Uh, but one thing that 
we have to understand is that the universe that we see today and the laws that govern the universe are not necessarily how the universe looked and functioned in the very beginning. So we have scientists who claim all these things, but they don't have observable data about millions of years ago. That data is not something that they can empirically test and prove themselves. Even for science, it's pure theory, even though they claim it to be historic or empirical or scientific fact. There's no test basis. When you have science, you have a control group of something you've tested and you've observed with your eyes and you've, you know, you've measured it, and then you, you can conduct experiments. Well, there's no test group for the Earth being millions of years old. Okay? They simply don't have empirical data. So, you know, the, the, the thing is that really, um, we simply believe God's word as it is. We take him as, you know, as his word. We take it as his word. And God doesn't want to be proven empirically. Okay, I believe he's put certain stumbling blocks within the Bible for scientists, for people like that, who are just intent of, we have to prove you empirically, we have to put you in our computer script and spit out this data to prove that you exist. I think that offends God. I don't think he wants to be proven empirically. You know, it takes faith. It's faith that, that pleases God. Yet it's a reasonable faith rooted in understanding of the scriptures um, that, that, we, that we have. But here's a third solution. And... Um, we can see, you know, there's, there's reasons why we can see that starlight. Zechariah 12, 3 says that God stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundations of the earth. So we see that God made the stars and then he stretched out the heavens potentially, right? So he could have made the stars in the beginning, stretched it out. And so the light would have been there from the very beginning. Zechariah 12, 3 again, that God stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth. So he made those stars and stretched them out. He stretched out the heavens. Job 9, 8 also says that it is God who alone spreadeth out the heavens. And Psalm 104, 2 also affirms that it is God alone who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. So it's not that we have blind faith. We have a trifold witness of God's word, saying that God stretched out the heavens, which would explain this. A friend of mine brought this biblical solution to me and pointed out these verses, so I want to give credit. Uh, that wasn't from me, it's a, but it's a great verse. But it's amazing that we have not just mere conjecture and theory, but a biblical answer you know, from the scriptures of how this could have you know, come to pass. Whereas, you know, and he also could have just created all mature, you know, in the beginning, like it says, you know. So either one, I mean, I don't care which one you believe. It's the fact is that God's word said he made it in six days. And that's ultimately what we believe. And so we need to take God at his word. The stupidest thing you can do about the existence of the universe is to say that it formed itself or that the physical creation has always existed, we know that can't be true because the universe is decaying. It's not eternal like God. And so the creation itself is the only physical signature of God's existence that he has given us. That's the only empirical evidence that we have, the fact of the creation itself. There is no reasonable alternative that you know the universe couldn't have just come to pass on its own. Somebody had to have created it, an all-powerful, intelligent, sentient being, which the Bible calls the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, had to have created the universe by his word. And so if you're trying to find God empirically, it's not going to happen other than through the creation. You know, you need to find God by grace through faith alone. And so to the scientists who reject God, I say, you know, what Jesus said to the Apostle Thomas when he wanted empirical proof. Jesus saith unto him in John 20, 29, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So our faith rests in the word of God, not, not in science and the changing trends of science. If God says he created it in six days, I'll take him in it at his word. And it's as simple as that. I don't need to understand it. You know, I just, I believe it. So let's pray and, and uh, we'll conclude with that. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for...
the truth of your word, the simplicity of your word, um, in all the ways that people try to come up against your word, but it always vindicates itself. I thank you that you created us and that you've provided a plan of redemption for us, as we'll see in the upcoming chapters, even in Genesis from the very beginning. And I, I thank you for the souls won as we went out soul winning yesterday that I talked about earlier. And I just pray that uh, you can bless them and bless them into finding a good church and finding good fellowship and studying and reading their words so they can grow as new babes in Christ. And I pray that you bless our family here and our church and that you help us to go out and to win souls and to stay true to the true doctrine of your word without wavering, simply taking you at, at your word and believing what you said, no matter how it looks to the world, no matter what the world says, what science says, I could care less what science says when it, when it comes to your word. God, it's your word that interprets the universe, not the other way around. We thank you, God, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.